Join Chris and Suzanne Vester today on Faith Family Fulfillment as they lead discussions on creating a strong bond and having a loving relationship through Christian values. Guests on the show share insightful stories and ideas to enhance a positive family upbringing and create trust in one another, as well as providing encouraging words of wisdom everyone should hear. And now, here are Chris and Suzanne. Well, hello there, and welcome to another episode of Faith Family Fulfillment. I'm your co-host, Chris. I'm Suzanne. With us, as always, I say it every time, an amazing couple, um, Pastor Keith and uh, Kraft and his wife, Sheila, co-pastor. Um, they're pastors and founders of Elevate Life Church um, that was founded in 2000 on Pastor Keith's 40th birthday. I just learned that. That's pretty cool. Um, been married 39 years, been together way more than that. And I asked how to describe them. Um, Pastor Keith, husband, father, pastor, mentor, coach, and Arthur. And oddly enough, when I said, well, how do I need to introduce Miss Sheila? And it was co-pastor, wife, mother, grandmother, Arthur, very similar um, <laughs> descriptions. And I looked up Pastor Keith's mission. It was to be a loving leader, mentor, motivator of biblical excellence that helps people reach their full God-given potential. That's awesome. So welcome to the podcast, guys. We appreciate your time, and we're excited about where this conversation is going to go. Well, it's an honor to be with you guys, and I'm excited for y'all because of your life, your marriage, your family, uh, your kingdom business. It becomes something and has become something that has created followable excellence for other people, and I just want to commend you for that. And our mutual friend, Steve Weatherford, has introduced us, and any friend of Steve's is a friend of mine. And so I already know y'all are great people because they came to the church, but you don't think you yeah, got to I see them. Too. But, uh, but it's so it's, it's an honor for us to be a part of this new venture that you guys are doing that I believe God is going to use to minister to a lot of people and particularly marriages. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. That's actually a hundred percent our goal. Yeah. That's a great, great summary. Cause that <laughs> is <you>. exactly it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And I, um, I'd like to pray us in, and then we can start with the interview. Does that work for you? Absolutely. Lord, we come to you, as we always do, with humble spirit, thanking you for the things that, just who you are, a loving, gracious, and merciful God to us, not for what you do, but for the way that you are and they act in our lives. We ask for your guidance in this conversation. We ask for your protection this time. And we know that the story will definitely be for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So Pastor Keith, you know, you and I had a conversation a couple months ago about, about this podcast. And I said to you, Hey, this is what I think we want to talk about. And you said, nah, nah, I got something I want to talk about. <laughs> and which, and when we went through it, I love what you had. So I think we should just start out. Tell me about how you and Miss Sheila and can I call you precious? If everybody else calls you precious, Miss Sheila, can I call you precious? Sure. <laughs> call her precious. That's what how, 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 where did the, where did it begin? Give us, go yeah. all the way back to the beginning. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. My father was a Dallas policeman. In fact, a unique story behind the story is he was the first man in the Texas book depository, found Lee Harvey Oswald's rifle, uh, found his chicken box. And uh, he was sitting there eating chicken before he assassinated John F. Kennedy. And but my dad was the first man up in the scene. So I grew up in a pastor's home. And in 1975, I was 15 years old. My dad uh, walked into my room one day. I'm on the bottom bunk. I, my brother and I have bunk beds. I'm on the bottom bunk. And he said, hey, just wanted to let you guys know, give you a heads up. We're moving to New Orleans, Louisiana. Well, immediately, I mean, we'd lived in the same house for 15 years. I went to elementary school, junior high. Now I'm in high school with all my friends. And at literally, it was like my world changed in an instant. He said, we'll be moving in one month. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in December of 1975, we moved to New Orleans. And I got, it, I got to New Orleans. And, uh, you know, after living in Dallas, which way back then was one of seven all-American cities. Uh, I don't think they do that anymore, but there were all-American cities that represented kind of America in a city. And Dallas was one of those places, very pristine, very clean, just really the aura of Dallas uh, to me growing up in Dallas was, I felt like I was a winner just because of where I lived. I mean, it was, 
it was just a magnificent place to be able to grow up and to see growth all around you and to see people coming from literally all over the world to be a part of that growth. Well, we go to New Orleans, Louisiana, and, you know, Louisiana starts with lose. I mean, I mean, for real. I mean, it's like I, I went, I'd never, I'd never been there. It was, it looked poor. Um, it looked depraved. It looked worldly. It looked, you know, I mean. But I'm, you found out the people were amazing. Oh, the people, listen, were amazing. Well, I'll get to that yes. in a minute, but feel free to interrupt <laughs> me anytime. This, this is so our, I'm good at that. This is our story. So what happened was I went to Bonneville High School uh, in New Orleans, which I walk in first day of school and I'm looking around, there's no girls. Well, I'm just, a, you know, full blooded American young man. And I, the concept of there not being any girls in the school was the, one of the weirdest things I'd ever experienced in my life. I'm looking around by the time third period came, I'm sitting in a math class with a guy and I turned to him, I said, what is the deal? I haven't seen one girl in this school. He said, oh man, you know, in New Orleans, he said, uh, you know, we have uh, all the public schools. They're like brother and sister schools. Like all the boys go to boy schools and all the girls go to girl schools. I went home that day, told my parents, I said, you've moved me to hell. I said, I cannot even believe what, what in the world, where is it in America where in public schools, all the boys go to one school and all the girls go to another school. I'd heard about that on a private level, but never on a public school level. That's all the public schools were. So long story short, about a month later, my parents um, moved us to Slidell. Slidell was 30 miles east of New Orleans. And I'll never forget watching Johnny Carson one night. And Johnny uh, turns to Ed McMahon and said, Ed, Slidell, Louisiana. Have you ever heard of Slidell, Louisiana? And Ed McMahon said, oh, Johnny, I haven't. He said, it's the fastest growing city in America. I thought, wow, God has moved us to the fastest growing city in America. My first day at Slido High School, the basketball coach comes up to me. And again, I'm 15, but I was at that time about 6'3", weighed about 165 pounds wet. I mean, I joke about it, but if, you, if I turn sideways and suck my tongue out, I look like a zipper. I mean, I was skinny. <laughs> hey, do you play basketball? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, we're playing the Salmon Spartans tonight come sit on the bench with us. And, uh, you know, obviously you can't dress out. It's your first day at school, but we want you to play. So I said, okay. So I, I went and I sat on the bench. I'm in my normal clothes. I'm watching the game. All of a sudden on the other side of the court, here's what I see. Cheerleaders. And I spotted this girl and I turned to the guy next to me. I didn't even know. I said, who is that? He said, well, she's going steady with somebody. That was the language back then. She was going steady with somebody, but there's one right down there that looks just like her. Man, I took a double take. They were identical twins. Right. And so the girl I saw second was her. I the was second choice. The girl I know, the girl <laughs> I saw first was her twin sister. <laughs> and so anyway, that night after the game, everybody went to McDonald's in Slide Hill. I go to McDonald's. She's sitting with all her little, what I call cheerweeder friends. And so I walked right up to her, looked right at her. I said, hi, my name is Keith Kraft. I'm new in town. She goes, I know. Well, my heart almost jumped out of my chest. It's my first day in town. And I said, would you like a Dr. Pepper? All her friends started giggling, all her little cheerleader, all their little outfits. They all got up and they left. I get her a Dr. Pepper. I bring the Dr. Pepper back to the table. And she said, I, I said, why did you uh, order, uh, get me Dr. Pepper? And he said, uh, well, because all the girls in Dallas like Dr. Pepper. But what you have to know is I hated Dr. Pepper. I thought it tasted <laughs> like cough medicine. And so and Dr. Pepper was invented in Texas. I don't know if y'all know that. The yeah. original Dr. Pepper plant was in Dallas. Right. So I went ahead and drank it and it literally became my favorite drink. <laughs> so we're sitting there and I, so I, we talked for a few minutes. I invited myself over to her house. Now, again, I had, I was 15. She was 15. I said, Hey, I'm new. As you know, I said, so maybe we go over the house, look at some of the annuals or whatever. So, so anyway, she nicely invites me over when well, she goes out to, you know, we're in the living room for her parents' house she goes and she comes back with an armful of annuals, starts opening up. And I said, hey, 
I said, um, so she said, well, this is the school. And this is, I said, so I put my hand on the annuals. And I said, hey, I'm really not interested in that. She goes, you're not? I go, no. I said, I just want you to know. I said, I'm a born again, spirit filled Christian. That was the first thing I told her about myself. She didn't say anything. She just got up and left the room. I literally thought, okay, I took my stand for God because I wasn't going to date anybody that wasn't a believer. And so she literally got up and left, didn't say anything. And so I was getting up. I was thinking, man, I guess that didn't connect with her. And her and her mother come walking back in the room. And her mother says, so you're a born again, spirit filled Christian. I stuck out my chest. I didn't have. And I said, yes, ma'am, I am. She goes, that's so wonderful. We've been believing God that our daughter would have friends like you. And I said, I am here. I am here. I mean, for the first time in my life, I felt like I was an answer to prayer, you know, and her mother quickly left with a smile on her face. We sat down, we started talking about God. Long story short, fast forward, anything you want to say about that? Yeah, just for me, um, because of growing up in, uh, you know, in my early years in Louisiana, it's predominantly Catholic and Baptist. So most, um, you know, the church that we went to at the time was a Baptist church. So to say he was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit was something that would be very foreign to anybody that I was in relationship, anybody I went to high school with. And so when he said that, he just took me so back, like, I can't believe it. This is somebody that grew up the way that I did, because we were, that's the church we grew up in, was a church that believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I didn't even think about saying anything to him. I thought, man, I just got to run and get my mom. She's just not going to believe that, you know, he's got the same philosophy, thought process, you know, relationship with God that, you know, how we think and what we believe. And so it was just, you know, pretty amazing that he chose me, you know, out of all the girls in our school, there's these beautiful girls with long legs on the dance team. And, you know, here I am this, you know, cheerleader. And it's like, how did he just choose me out of all the girls in our school when he was new at the school, I just felt very honored that I was chosen as a first. It's not like he came to school and then he dated multiple girls. And then eventually he discovered, you know, I was this Christian too. He just picked me out of group of people and, you know, just, I don't know, God just directed our steps. And it's pretty amazing. And hey, were there any girls that were mad at you? Yes. People, people were breaking up with their boyfriends because they wanted a chance to date him. <laughs> That's sweet. But anyway, oh, here's what happened. One month later, fast forward, one month later, January 20th, 1976, I'd had a birthday January 9th, so I was now 16. We'd been kind of, you know, dating for about a month. And I said, hey, I want to talk to you. I said, I'd like to ask you to be my girlfriend. I said, before you say anything, I said, I have this philosophy about how I think relationships ought to work. So, Chris, this was my first leadership seminar. I didn't know it, but it was. And she was a captive audience. And so she was but she was just like, like going like what? Like, really? I go, yeah. So I took out a piece of paper, drew a triangle. And I said, this is you. This is me. This is God at the top. Then I drew two arrows and I said, I, here's what I believe about relationships. I believe that if you'll be your best for God and I'll be my best for God that we'll meet at the top. And then I drew an arrow between each of us. And I said, then whatever we decide to do, I said, I think God will put his hand on it. I said, what do you think about that? I said, I like that. I think that's a great idea. And so I said, well, there's a couple of other things. And so I know she was like, how were you feeling when I was saying some of this stuff? I mean, I don't know. It was just a little over my head. Cause I'm just, <laughs> you know, I'm a cheerleader. I love, you know, just, going to ball games, love my friends. And even though I had a relationship with God, I didn't go as deep as far as really thinking through like me being my best. My mom had always said, you know, I grew up in a family of, well, there was three girls and me being Just identical like twin. Family. Yeah. And, you know, so I always felt like I really strived to be my best, but I didn't talk about that. So when he was saying like, you be your best, uh, there was a little conflict in that just, you know, as kind of as we went later on, because my mom always said, well, you are your best, you know, you're perfect just the way that you are. And so in that, I was thinking, well, good, you know, I'm glad he wants to be his best because I already am my best, you know, but I didn't know I had work to do to be my best. So, you know, that is an advanced, that's an advanced thought process for a 16 year old kid. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, it really was the Holy Spirit, and it really my mother, my mother, all my life had prayed over me for the wisdom of God, and I know it was the wisdom of God because I had already decided these are the kind of relationships that I'm going to have. Here's what I feel like that. Here's who I am. Here's who I am in Christ, and and who I'm going to align my life with are going to share those same values. And so I didn't know to call them values at that time. But here's what I told her. I said, Well, there's a few more. There's a few more things I'd like to talk about before we, you know, you consider being my girlfriend. I said, so I said, there's a scripture in the Bible uh, in Ephesians that says, you know, don't let the sun go down on your anger and give your, give the devil a foothold. So I said, everybody's going to get angry. I said, we're going to get angry in our relationship. I said, but let's don't practice divorce. So she's just like looking at me. I said, cause here's what I said, here's what divorced people do. What divorced people do is they get angry and then they stop talking and they start walking away from each other. And then they, they can't reconcile it because they don't realize it, but they're practicing divorce every time they choose not to talk and just stay angry and let days pass. Oh, and I said, so here's my philosophy. My philosophy is God gives you 24 hours to deal with your anger. So in your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So I said, so I just want to ask you if we date, if we, if you are my girlfriend, that we would that we would try to work everything out in, in a 24 hour period. So he would said, you know, even though we have a curfew, cause we did, we both had a curfew we had to be in. And uh, so he said, if for some reason that uh, we haven't worked it out, then we just need to call each other on the phone because we don't need to go to back uh, to bed upset. And so that's exactly what we do because, you know, we had a lot of fights through the years. We're so opposite from each other. We'll get to that in a minute. I know, but okay. I'll just say, so we had a lot of conversations yeah. over the phone even. Yeah, we did because, again, that was very important to me because I came from a family and I can't tell that everybody else's family, but there was not a lot of conflict resolution. I had an older brother, younger sister. We fought all the time. Very little conflict resolution. Uh, my sister has been married three different times. You know, my brother had his own issues. My issue being a middle kid was I would look at my brother, look at my younger sister, look at my parents. And I felt like I was like in the, the, you know, in a very sweet spot to be able to go, okay, I don't want that. I don't want that. And with the wisdom of God, it was like conflict resolution was a big deal to me. And so anyway, I said, so would you agree to try to work it out like in a 24 hour period? And she goes, yes. I said, I said, well, there's one other thing. And she goes, okay. And I said, if you say yes, I said, today's January 20th. And I said, if you say yes on this day for as long as we're together, I'm going to honor you. So she goes, well, what does that mean? I said, I don't know what it means. I said, but I'm just going to honor your yes. And uh, so anyway, so we talked a little bit more. And so she said, I'm going to be your girlfriend. Well, so on February 20th, I brought her some flowers, brought her a card. She goes, what's up? I said, it's our first anniversary to being girlfriend and boyfriend. And usually it's the girl that keeps track of these dates. But, you know, I was really clueless to what the date was and that he was like, this is one month in. And this is I told you that I was going to celebrate you on the 20th. And, you know, so he gave me flowers. Then the next month came around and he's like, Oh, today's our second month anniversary. I would sometimes felt kind of bad. Cause I'm like, I need to be better girlfriend here at keeping up with these days. <laughs> but I, I probably, it wasn't as much of a, you know, a thought process that I had or really maybe even understood at the time, but it would, there's always be something different. Sometimes it'd be a card. Sometimes it would be some type of jewelry or just some thought process on that day that he would do for me, which was very special. But I think if I could just say yeah. the best part about it, um, and he could tell you more about where we are today and that number is that he never had the expectation that I would celebrate him in the same way. Because, you know, as somebody, a lot of times we live our lives that way, we, are, we bring a strength to our relationships. And then we put that on our spouse to bring that same strength. And so he never did that. He never got, uh, was disappointed to say, well, I just can't believe you can't keep up with this date. You know, the fact that you don't place value on it. He's never said that because I did value it. I just bring different gifts and strengths to the relationship than what, you know, he brings. And so we value each other for the strengths that we both bring, not having the expectation that we're to both do the same thing and bring the same strengths that each other brings. 
So I would just say after all these years, 40 plus years of us being together, that never one time has he ever been disappointed because I didn't give him a card or I didn't remember the date or anything like that. So I just think that's something that's very important in relationships. Yeah, the check actually huge. So this month is 542 months. So I've celebrated her on the 20th of every month uh, for the last 542 months. And that's not a pat on my back. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that to me, honor is the one thing that will make everything in your life work the way God intended for it to work. When you honor God with the first dollar of every 10, when you honor other people, we don't honor people because they deserve it. We honor people because we're honorable. And when you buy into that, and when you understand that, the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 22, the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon said in verse four, by humility and fear of the Lord or honor come riches, honor, and life. And so that was a secret that even Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to God, but when they're revealed, they belong to us and our children forever. And so what became a very beautiful thing was that I would celebrate her on the 20th. And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories around that. uh, And then we can, I'll kind of stop and we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. But this is the story. This is how we got started. So the 20th became a very special day to me. Um, and this is the mistake, and this is what uh, Sheila was talking about. This is the mistake people make in their marriage. It is the number one mistake people make in their marriage. And that is they begin to project their expectations on their spouse. So in other words, whatever my awareness is, okay, whatever my awareness is, gives me insight into what I bring to a relationship. And so unfortunately, people use their awareness or, or they misuse their awareness by what they become aware of rather than them seeing themselves as the solution in that problem or that situation. They begin to project their awareness on somebody else and say, why don't you do this? Why aren't you this way? Why do you say that? Why well, would never say that? Why blah, 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 blah. So in other words, the deal for me was I'm the one that said, I'm going to honor you on the 20th of every month. I never expected that and still do not expect, there's no expectation that I have uh, about her based on who I am as a person. And see, that's what so many people miss in their marriage. What they miss in their marriage is whatever they're aware of about themselves or their spouse, whatever they're aware of both positively and negatively, whatever they're aware of that they like and they don't like, They begin to project that awareness onto their spouse rather than just knowing, no, that's what I bring to the marriage. Mm -hmm. I bring that awareness to the marriage. I don't bring that awareness. So so let let me paint it in a different scenario. People who become negative, people who become judgmental, people who become critical of other people, which Jesus warned, do not do that. Judge not lest you be judged also for by the same measure that you judge, it'll be judged and measured back to you. People who become negative, people who become critical about other people, they are misusing their awareness. They're taking what they're aware of and they're using it to judge somebody. They're taking their awareness and they're using it to be negative about somebody. They're taking their awareness and they're using it to criticize somebody rather than understanding if you're going to have great relationships, then whatever you're aware of is what you bring first. Whatever you're aware of is what you judge in yourself first. Jesus said it this way. He said, listen, don't point out the speck in your brother, your spouses, or any relationship that you have. Don't point out the speck in their eye because you've got to move the beam out of your own eye to do it. What was he trying to say? Don't use your awareness that way. Don't use your awareness to be a spectator. Use your awareness as a part of God's glory that's in you, that's a part of the greatness of who you are that makes that relationship greater because of your awareness of what you bring. So again, I know that's a lot. That is a huge, huge deal that so many people in their marriage, they don't even know why they're struggling. And the reason they're struggling is because 
they're utilizing their awareness or misusing their awareness to become negative, critical, judgmental, and to focus on what their spouse isn't rather than what their spouse is, not realizing that Sheila's destiny in who she is, my destiny in who I am, God said it was not good for a man to be alone. So he took the best part of man out of man. Let me explain it this way. So God caused man to fall into a deep sleep. And then he took a rib and he created woman. Well, the man woke up and he goes, whoa, man. God said, yeah, that's her name. And that's how you need to treat her. Like, whoa, man. Why? Because Keith Craft, I took the best part of you out of you. I created woman. And in other words, as you honor her, you're honoring me. As you choose to see the best, believe the best, speak the best over her, you're believing the best, speaking the best, and seeing the best in your own self. And so what the devil does is he messes people up. He messes your marriage up. Because if he can mess up your marriage, at one point, the person you decided to marry is the person that loved you for better or for worse, loved you for richer or poorer, loved you in good times and in bad times. They promised that. They pledged that. What happens? What happens is, again, we start focusing on what they're not based on our awareness of what's lacking in my marriage, rather than realizing, like I had a worship leader one time. He was a, we first started our church. He was our worship pastor. He came to me and he said, man, I'm going to have to leave the church. I said, why? Like we were very close friends. I said, why? He said, because I don't feel the spirit of the Lord here. Mm -hmm. I start crying, Chris. And I said, you do realize you're the worship leader. Like you're the one that's supposed to help us usher into into the presence of the Lord. Yeah, but I just don't feel it here. And he he ended up, he, he and his wife, they ended up leaving. Their family ended up leaving because he never realized this revelation that I'm telling you. Whatever gap you see in your marriage is yours first to fill. Oh, wow. It's not yours to point out. It's not yours to be dissatisfied. It's not yours to be discontent about what your spouse is or isn't. Whatever gap you see is like business. Okay, here's business. I don't, if, I, if I'm an entrepreneur, now watch this. If I'm not an entrepreneur, I can be like everybody else, complain, bicker, you know, gripe, bellyache about how things are. But when you're an entrepreneur, here's what you know. You don't just find a need and fill it. You find a need and lead it. In other words, you provide a solution to people's problems. God put every person on the face of the earth to not only be a solution to somebody's problem, but watch this, fill a gap in that person that that person couldn't do without you in their life. That's so good. That's so good. I want to touch on what I've, what I've heard so far, which has been amazing, right? Number one, we decided not to practice divorce really, really early because divorce is practiced before it happens. A hundred percent. And the way it's practiced, Chris, is it's practiced when I choose not to resolve conflict as quickly as possible. I heard Miss Sheila say about expectations, the expectation of you not expecting the same out of her, right? Which led to the conversation about how the number one problem is when you project the expectation onto the other person. The gap you see is yours to fill. Those are re- three really good takeaways. <laughs> and if I could just say this, just as it relates to really another story, but correlates to it is that um, it was really wasn't that long ago. It's probably in the last year that there was a conflict that we were having and just a discussion really. And, but it really wasn't resolved. I was on a totally different page than he was. And so we let a little bit of time go by and we really kind of weren't talking. We were just at a silent place of, you know, both of us just contemplating, I think what was said and, you know, maybe a little bit of hurt feelings in it and for both of us. And so I came back to him and I told him, I said, hey, listen, I want to tell you that the thing that you've always been a strength to me is you've always helped me work through whenever we've had conflict. So what I, what I was doing was reminding him of, you know, the strength of what he brings to our relationship. And I said, 
you always help me because a lot of times I'm a lot more emotive. I have more emotions because of just, you know, how God made me. I'm more, you know, I don't know. I'm not, can't say I'm more sensitive, but I'm, you know, in situations, um, you know, I just operate more on feelings. I can feel the room. I can feel what somebody is, you know, feeling right now. Like I'll say, you know, I don't think that conversation went well, or I don't think that this person, I'm not sure where they are just because of what I feel. You well, know, let, so- well, let me pause because she's a feel first. Yeah. She's a think second and she's an act third. I am a think act and feel so i think and once i think it through we're taking action well then whatever feelings that come with that well you can imagine the conflict we have because she feels first i feel last and when i say i feel last it's not that i'm not very uh sensitive in other words my feelings aren't facts it's very easy for me like my feelings aren't facts they're just my feelings you know i mean one of my leadership apologies is It's easier to act your way into a feeling than feel your way into an action. So, so many people, they get messed up because they're waiting to feel it to do it. So this is some of our conflict. It's not that that her way is wrong and my way is right. No, it's just the way we're wired. I think first, I act second, I feel third. She feels first, then she thinks, then she acts. A lot of First thing you said is I honored his gift to me in that conflict resolution. How did that end up? Yeah. So, um, so in that, I just communicated just very nicely, but I said, you've always helped me whenever we've been in any kind of conflict where I have a lot of emotions, I'm upset, but he's always been more reasonable to kind of work through the emotions. Cause he's not doesn't stay in that emotive state of these are the facts. This is what happened. And, and then helps me process through maybe some thought processes as it relates to it. But he wasn't doing that. So I told him, I said, you know, you really do help me when you do that, because I didn't want to be in conflict with him. And I didn't want us to be upset with each other. And I didn't want time to go by. But I really was having a hard time overcoming it just by myself. Now, I mean, I understand I could leave myself. But, you know, but that's the real real. Right. I mean, that's doesn't matter how long you've been together. It's like you, you just have things that happen and you're a real human being. I mean, you got, you do have feelings and you do have your opinions and, and all of that. And back to Proverbs 22, verse four, this is interesting. The way the wisest man that ever lived said it by humility, giving up your right to be right and fear of the Lord honor. So the only thing that comes before honor in scripture is humility. So you have to decide if you're going to have a great marriage, I'm going to have to give up my right to be right here because here's the thing. The only time, you know, as a leader, Chris, I know you, you're this way, even though we don't know each other as well, but you don't build great businesses without thinking you're right. Most of the time. I mean, it's like it, with your, with your knowledge of business or, Hey, here's the next move or here's so in a marriage, the great equalizer is, Like there's a lot of times where I know, okay, this is right, but I'm going to give up my right to be right. Not that I'm more right than her, but in my thought process, like, okay, I know what I'm thinking is right. So I have to, the only time there's a pause in our relationship is when I'm working through, honestly, how I'm going to humble myself in this situation. And when she came and she said that, that was it. It was done in three minutes. literally. And because of the the posture and the way that I came, you know, because I really genuinely wanted us to work through it and move on. And so just me, like I said, it's so important how we present ourselves to our spouses. Because if I came just angry, yelling at him, saying, you know, who do you think you are? You know, you you just, you know, the way you're being and you're not talking to me. And I mean, that's not going to accomplish anything. So just saying you've always been a strength to me and you've always helped me work through when we're in conflict and we talk through things. So we haven't done that. I'm asking you, I really need your help because I have a lot of emotions involved in what, what our conflict was and a lot of feelings into it. So I really need your help. And that was really her humbling herself too, you know, to say, I need your help. And so I think I want you to see the difference in how she approached it. Like she said, she could have said, and this is what most people do. Here's what you did. Here's why I'm mad. And here's why you need to apologize. 
Right. Here's what here's the different approach. I need you to help me because I'm struggling with this. Totally different. He no. doesn't want to help, right? Exactly. So a lot of what people, and this is too deep a dive for us to go into right here. I mean, this is why we do couples masterminds. This is why we coach because it's some deep, deep stuff, but with transformational results. So in every man and every woman, there's masculine and feminine. Now, here's what you, you got to realize that we call them, you know, a type personalities or whatever. So the stronger a woman is verbally, now she is very strong. She's just not as verbally strong, but the stronger a, a woman is verbally, she ignites the masculine in a man. And now masculine is fighting against masculine. So both men and women are feminine and masculine. I mean, God's not just a male God. He is male, but he's male and female. So he created man. He created both male and female. So again, it's too deep of a dive to go into, but a lot of conflict in marriages are because masculine and masculine are fighting against each other. And so once you engage that side of a man to where you're going to fight with him, most men are going to fight to win themselves. They're not going to fight to win for us. Right. And so again, that's not a male or female thing. That's a masculine and feminine thing. For sure. So yeah. anyway, there's a lot to that, but I see you're the brewing on the question. No, I'm really not. I'm just, <laughs> I'm really enjoying the conversation. Um, but I will ask one since okay. you did give me the opportunity to have the floor for a second. Um, <laughs> when you guys were, you know, then evolving into your early twenties, um, marriage, you know, starting a family, what were the challenges, um, that you guys faced? Cause you know, pastor Keith, you said, you know, you kind of had a, a fairly deep spiritual grounding. Um, Sheila, you said yours was not quite as deep. So how did you guys find a really good middle ground? How did you feed each other as you were moving through each of those seasons? Yeah, so I had just as deep spiritual walk as he did. I grew up by the time I was a little girl, it's five years old, I accepted the Lord. And I grew up in church my whole life. And I think it, just in our lives uh, with having young kids and him being on the road, there were times that uh, I traveled with him on the road with our kids. And then there were seasons where we came off the road because of, you know, maybe it was just a different season of our kids' lives. We wanted to be involved in sports or we put them in school. A lot of their years, I homeschooled them. So we were, I was on the road 40 plus weeks a year for 10 years. And so probably some of the, you know, I would say um, greatest challenges for me as a mother was, um, was the times that he was on the road. He would leave on a Saturday. He'd return home on a Thursday, usually midday, and then leave back again on that next Saturday. So sometimes I felt like I was a single mom, even though I wasn't, I can't relate to a single mom. Cause you know, you're really all alone. I at least still had my husband that I could talk to on the phone about challenges or difficulties that I had with the kids. And so, you know, those were some of our, you know, would be some of the tough times that we would have, but, you know, um, but I wouldn't just say, you know, yes, it was hard, but we always look forward to when he would come home and it's very special when we reunited, he always made, us a priority. He made our relationship a priority. So we always had a date night every week. So it gave us a time of just connecting. So we would have a babysitter that would come and stay with the kids. And, but when he was home, he was fully engaged with our kids and then, but he made me a priority too. So, you know, I don't know. I think, I, I think we've done a really good job. We dated eight and a half years before we got married. We had a lot of conflict before a we got married because we were so different from each other. And then I would find myself frequently as, you know, even into our years where we were raising kids, uh, it seemed to be there was the number one question I would always say. Yeah, you'll love have, this question, Chris. Is why are you acting that way? And what is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> because Why are you acting that way? And what is wrong with you? Now, from a business standpoint, guess what? Nobody asks us that. They just watch our dust. Right. <laughs> right? It's like, hey, here's why I'm acting this way. Here's why I'm doing this, because this is the way I'm doing it. Like, here we go. There's the mountain. Let's go attack the mountain. Well, now all of a sudden, I'm bringing somebody along in that process, you know? 
It, well, there would just be conversation. There'd be things that he would say and, uh, you know, are, are very straightforward yeah. and very direct. And so my approach is not that way. I'm more, you know, I'm softer. I'm more encouraging. So I would say, why are you acting that way? Because it would be things I would never say. It was just like, you know, it would say it'd be things that would hurt my feelings, yeah. you know? And so it was just my way. And I was honestly, I was like in shock about it. What, that are okay well but, but I, I grew up in a family and, and i think that affects our marriages you know and how we grew girls. up it's so all girls we were always very sensitive to each other you know we we never resolved conflict in our relationship because frankly we didn't have a lot of conflict uh but if we did one of the things that sounds just really crazy is that um i would go hit my sister's baby doll that laid on her bed and so uh so she would know that Cause she went in her room and the baby doll was moved. And, uh, and so she would go back in my room and hit my baby doll. I mean, it sounds crazy, but we really didn't, um, we weren't, we didn't get, we weren't raised in a family that really um, communicated and really had conflict resolution, you know, came, it's just like within 24 hours, we usually worked through it. We all, all just moved on. They didn't but talk about we it. We didn't they really talk about it, but we didn't really have a lot of really heavy conflict because of us all being girls. We had a wonderful mom, so loving. Now, Keith grew up in a totally different family, you know, so they were just like fight with each other. Verbal, screaming, his, yelling. One time he came to the front door. He had a black eye. His brother, he was late for my a day. My brother knocked my two front teeth out. So we had a different way of dealing with conflict, which is why I wanted conflict resolution, by the way. That was what, that's what drove me because I thought, man, this is not what I want. I don't want screaming, yelling, fighting. You know, I don't want that spirit in my family. So that's why it was so important to me to go, look, we let's learn how to deal with this. So even in our talk about that in so our early, early communication. Yeah. yeah. See, so there would be conflict that we would have even early on. And that's why I say a lot of our conflict happened in the first eight and a half years, because that's a long time to date. You know, we're while was, you're growing up. We were 15 years old. We got married when we were 23. Mm -hmm. When we were 23. And so it's just a long time of like, this is your most formative years where you're really figuring out your life of choosing to stay together when you don't have to stay together choosing yeah. to work through stuff when you don't have to work through stuff so whenever we would we have a disagreement we would fight you know he said i want us to always communicate well i didn't really understand how to communicate it's like communicate yeah i like to talk but it's like talk about like surface things or you know things from high school or friends or whatever but when you talk about having a conflict and communicate i mean that's a little bit different i didn't really know how to do it because in my family, we didn't work through conflicts, so we didn't really talk about it. We just let things go. So I would tell him, like, I'm fine. I don't need to talk about it. Like, I'll get over it. And he's like, no, we're going to talk through it. And so I didn't know how. It sounds so crazy. But when you're growing up. This is a lot of people. What she's saying is a lot of people, both male and female, based on how they grew up in their family. So when you grow up and that's all you do is your conflict is you hit your sister's baby doll. And that's all, you don't have any other you know, conversation Then I really genuinely didn't want to show how I was upset. I wanted to work through it myself because I thought if I tell him, because uh, I know he could over talk me like his communication was beyond. So like even if I said that I was upset about something. He would tell me all the reasons why I didn't need to be upset. So to me, sometimes I felt like it did no good to say why I was upset because he could over talk me and over reason me. Uh, so I was like, I'm just fine. And I don't want to say anything. I don't want to stir things up or I don't want, I'm like a person. I just want peace. I don't care. You know, I, I'll work through anything myself just to have peace. And, just, and for me, I'm uh, first night, Sean Connery, peace is on the other side of war. <laughs> the truth, right? Come it's on. the truth. And so for her, it's peace at all costs. And so again, this dynamic is real in almost every relationship. One person just really wants peace. And it's not that the other person doesn't want peace, but you got to fight for it, you know, so go ahead. Yeah, so I didn't really know how to do that. So what he did, it sounds really crazy right now, but we were young, I was, you know, 15. And so he said, well, what I'm going to do, because I didn't want to talk. I said, no, I'm not going to say anything. I don't want to talk about it. I'm fine. And he's like, nope. He goes, we're going to talk about it. He said, so he would start to say, "Is he goes, I just want you to shake your head, yes or no, if this is how you're feeling. So he would express. And if he, he, if he wasn't on, I would just say no. So then he would talk some more and said, well, then are you feeling this way? 
And then I would shake my head, yes. And so, but what okay. happened is that he helped me to truly learn how to communicate. And uh, so through the years, I don't know, I haven't stopped talking and I haven't stopped telling him <laughs> how he can be better because he started it all by, you know, just really helping me learn how to communicate with him. And so, you know, which most people don't know, you know, how do you do that? How do you start that? Well, one person who's the better communicator needs to help the person, you know, work through it. And that's really what he did with me. And so that really did help us throughout our relationship to learn conflict resolution. That's cool. That's a great answer. That was a great answer. So I want to honor you when you talked about the months, because I, I want to come back to the 20, because I know there's some important stories in that too. This is yeah. really awesome. Um, and once I heard this, what you did to some degree, nowhere near probably to the, to the depth or um, even quality that you do that, um, I began to try to honor Suzanne in that way. Cause I thought, man, what a great, that's awesome. What a great way. So, I mean, September's a big month for us. We met September the 18th. Um, we got engaged on September the 16th and we got married on September the 14th, not all the same year, Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but there were three years. So the 18th was our first quote unquote date, I guess we could say. So I began, I actually put it in my calendar so I don't forget um, because That's it is awesome. something new for me. Um, so this coming 18th is, uh, we're about 200 behind you, 341 months for us. That's so, awesome. I love that you're inspired by that and that you take super- action on that, which so, so speaks of you, not only as a leader and as a lifelong learner, but somebody that, that has the capacity to be inspired by greatness. Here's the bottom line. I'm not talking about my greatness. I'm just talking about greatness as a principle. Okay. So I, everybody has greatness, but you, you've always got one of three responses to greatness. You're either inspired by somebody else's greatness, you're intimidated by their greatness, or you're jealous of it. And unfortunately, that happens even in marriages. Rather than really honoring somebody's greatness, you're intimidated by their greatness, or you're jealous of their greatness. You know, so I, I want to commend you for allowing yourself to be inspired by whatever that greatness quotient is that you see that in me doing that and honoring her, that, that you, that that would be something that would impact you. I actually made it a little bit of a challenge. So I just, the first time I just sent her, thank you. And he sent me a text in a text message. Was, thank like, you for, it took me about three days to figure it out. <laughs> she said, what, what is that about? I said, you gotta figure it out. <laughs> you gotta, uh, she hadn't heard what you did. So she did eventually figure it out. So, yeah. Um, but the 20 well, so the diamond rings and the, uh, you know, whatever else that you like, that's what he's going to do for you in the future on the 18th. <laughs> so he'll make it where you won't have to wonder. Oh, wow. Anyway, go ahead, Chris. Um, but so the 20th is a big day. I want to, I want to go into the stories that are around the 20th. Cause those are like, those are hugely impactful stories. I think when you, yeah, well, thank you. So long story short, I'll, I'll make it quick. So I honored her on the 20th of every month. And so Fast forward 40 years later, 40 years later, on the same day, Tuesday, January 20th, our first grandbaby is born. And it was like, God just showed me what you chose to honor. I'm, I've marked in heaven. I'm going to honor it. Our second grandbaby was born on September 20th. September 20th. First two grandbabies were born on the 20th. Well, her twin sister is somebody that I introduced to her husband when we were in college. Both of their grandbabies were born on the 20th. Their first. Their first grandbabies yeah. were on the 20th. My brother, who married her older sister, that I introduced them, their grandchildren, their first, first. first grandchildren, and of all their kids were born on the 20th. It was all like, in other words, everything that I was a part of aligning, God said, I'm going to mark that. It it doesn't mean anything to them, but it means a lot to me because I know I'm the one that decided to make the 20th an important day, you know, but, and then uh, just on a side note, as a car guy, Chris, uh, I, one of my cars, I'm a, I'm, I would be considered a car fanatic. I have always loved cars. My first car, the car that I picked her up on our first day was a 69 Mustang with a 351 Cleveland. It was just, just bad to the bone. Anyway, I've always liked cars. My dad paid $300 for that car. He had no idea. He wasn't, he didn't care about cars. When I rolled up in that car, I was like, oh my goodness. He said, this is your car for high school. I went, oh dad, you have no idea. Anyway, so that kind of set a course. But anyway, 
one of my cars is a is a Porsche GT3, and the license plate says the 20th, just because on one of my favorite fun things in the earth is just to honor her, you know, and to honor that day, you know, and uh, and it just goes on and on. I mean, there's just so many things that have happened, but that's that's a few of the most significant things that have happened. It's just so amazing. Every life that we basically touched, that some something's happened for that person on the twentieth, you know. It's just those little nudges, letting you know, like, yeah, I see you. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Oh, oh, and then the most recent thing is we sold a house on September twentieth. We bought, and we weren't, we weren't trying to. We bought our next house, which was we just purchased twenty eight acres on October twentieth. We closed on that. Because all of our children, we have three children. They're, of course, married and we have grandkids. They've expressed that they want to live on the same property with us. And so they're all building houses. And so that we're going to, they said, we just want our grandchildren to be around you guys. And so we bought property just so I built her dream house. We were living in her dream house. And yes, uh, we were. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It's like it took two years to build and it was my dream. And but really uh, the dream that was always in our heart that we spoke out to our kids when they were little is that one day we're going to all live on land together. Well, it's not that we forgot that dream, but a lot of times things just pass and your kids yeah, get, married get married and move on. And you're, you know, you don't want to bring that back up going, Oh, if we go buy land, will you come move on? You know, we want it to be in our kids' hearts. So not that we just kept thinking about it. We just thought the next house, you know, we'll move into, it'll be more like our retirement or whatever, you know, we'll, we won't, we'll downsize. And um, so when our daughter, our youngest daughter came to us and said, daddy, you always said that we were going to live on land together. Are we ever going to do that? Well, we're thinking this is our last big house and then we're going to be, you know, downsizing. Well, so we've got houses in Colorado and Florida and all that. So, so like we're just we trying to have need a big house. house and, but mainly it's for our kids and grandkids when they come over and all those kind of things, you know. And so uh, anyway, so we let about a month go by. And so we're just like, oh, man, we're so settled. We love the house. Yeah. We just we had it designed, especially the way that we liked it, you know, for our own living. And so then our son came to us and he said the same thing. He said, Dad, I'm so ready to get out of this subdivision I live in and the homeowners and all this just driving me crazy. And Are we ever going to move on land together? And so I sat down in that moment. I was on the phone with my son when he told me that. And I sat down and I said, okay, I put, I just put down land in. And the next town that was closest to us is a town called Salina. And it's this one house that pulled up and it was the exact house that I'd seen when our daughter and, but I said, oh no, I do not want that. The land was beautiful. It's a barn dominium. The house that was on it was a barn dominium. And I'm thinking, I live in a beautiful home, huge stone fireplace. The whole she lives house. in the Ritz Carlton. She's going to be moving to. And I'm going to go six. move to a barn. <laughs> you know, I was just like, but you know what? It was all for you know our legacy of our children. And I wrote a book called "Live Your Legacy," and so that's always been in Keith and I's heart is to live the legacy that we live with our children. That's why our children are all pastors with us. You know, it'd be a lot easier to just hire pastors and have people come in and just uh, expect them to do a job and, you know, hire them, you know, for the job that they do. So raising our kids in the ministry alongside of us is not, has not always been the easiest because they were young and, you know, when they graduated from college and came with us and, you know, it was a lot of helping them grow up, pouring into them. And it continues to be, you know, we have regular family meetings. That's probably the thing that we've done with our children since they were little that's been the number one thing that we would say um that our children have benefited from we have benefited from uh and even to this day we have close relationship because of those family meetings so when we call a family meeting with our kids even to this day sometimes their spouses won't be you know and most of the time they're not we just call our kids back into a family meeting it's very comfortable for them they don't always know what we're going to talk about uh but sometimes it's based on some things we need to resolve or you know, conversations we need to have that maybe there's a conflict between a sibling or whatever. And that, you know, we just need to get on the same page, but it's always very healthy. And I think it's why we, why our kids want to live on the land with us is because we've continued to have conversation and work through conflict with them. So, so I'll just kind of end that part by saying this, that um, 
that I want, I didn't just want to have a good relationship with my wife and my children. I wanted to have a great relationship. And that meant that we had to establish a culture of intimacy where we talked about everything and talked through everything. So for instance, the last family meeting we had, which was about a month ago, seven hours. That's the longest family meeting we have ever most, had. Most people can't, most people couldn't fathom that. Like sitting down with your family and having a discussion for seven hours. Great relationships take great process. You have to be willing to talk through things. You have to be willing to listen to other people. You have to be willing to say you're sorry. You have to be willing. So sometimes even I'm giving you the most recent example. Like we say family meetings. I mean, we or family gatherings. We would do this while our children were growing up. But it was to establish a culture of intimacy because I wanted to be close to them. And that's what I was saying to her going back, Chris, being 15 years old. I said, look, you know, let's don't let let's don't let anger keep us from talking. Let's always communicate. Let's always no matter. Let's have hard conversations. And you've probably seen the thing that I've written. I don't know Steve has shared it, but choose your heart. You got to choose your heart. So I would rather have hard conversations then not have a relationship with my wife, not have a relationship with my children, whatever the conversation needs to be. And even if they need to talk to me, which they regularly do to say, Hey dad, here's what we want to share. It's not like I'm holding court. It's like, no, we're having a family discussion. I'm just providing the, the incubator, if you will, of greatness so that we can talk about whatever we need to talk. So I was like, if somebody said, what's the secret to a great marriage? It's, it'll never be perfect, but what's the secret to being great is you have to desire to be intimate, to have intimacy and to be willing to talk through things, talk about everything and just be willing to work through it. You know, that's awesome. And, and when you and you and I talked back in December, I told you that's the exact way our, our family is. My father, he's in the thoroughbred business as well as the car business. We've got 77 acres in one spot and my sister and her family live 50 yards from me and my dad's about 600 yards from me and I said isn't that amazing that's awesome that's amazing it's amazing and it's a challenge yeah right? 100% it's absolutely both um but I'll tell you this as challenges as it can be sometimes I would not trade it for anything like I, right. I love the fact that my kids can be that close to my parents, you know, yeah. uh, it's just, it's like I said, it's a blessing. It's cause it, you know, the whole idea of it takes a village. I don't like where that came from. Right. But the village is our village. I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah. one of the questions I, I love to ask as we close up is when we're talking to couples that as a couple, you know, everybody has gifts, like for sure individual gifts, but as a couple, what do you consider your superpower to be? Like if you could just pick one thing that as a couple, you guys know this affects people. What would you think that your superpower as a couple would be? I'm not really sure. Let me process that for a minute. Yeah. Are you asking that individually or are you asking that just as a married couple? What would be our superpower as a couple? As a couple. Yeah. Okay. A couple. I would say a couple of things. I would say first and foremost, and this sounds super spiritual and I don't mean it to be super spiritual, but it just is what it is. And that is, um, we are not just Christians. We are kingdom minded, biblical worldview, God first living people. And so it's not enough today to be a Christian. It's not enough to believe in Jesus and make sure your salvation is secure and that you're going to go to heaven. We live in a world right now that if Christians don't become kingdom minded and begin to live with a transcendent cause, Christianity as we know it, the church as we know it, and the world as we know it are not going to exist. So I say that with as much passion and in as intensity as I can, that our superpower is we are not just Christians. We are kingdom minded, God first living with the transcendent cause with every business that I'm a part of to advance the kingdom of God, to give millions into the kingdom, to advance God's cause. That is our superpower. And what comes off of that is uh, generosity. Um, the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. Those that bless others will be blessed themselves. 
Proverbs 11, 24 and 25 in the Message Bible. So generosity would be a superpower that we have. Um, this year, I was the number one giver in our church. We have a very large church until a guy just right at the 11th hour wrote another $100,000 check and beat me. But I'm just saying, we don't compete. I'm joking about that. But the guys that are around me know I'm, gonna, I'm living to advance God's kingdom. And so you're going to have to outgive me because that is a superpower. So I think when I think when you're generous, you're the most like God. And Sheila is my partner in that. I'll just share one, one little story with you. Way back, 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 back. Um, when I told her we were, we were aligned with the church and I told her that we were going to write a $100,000 check to this church that we were a part of. I wasn't a pastor. Uh, I was, again, in kingdom business, but I wasn't a pastor at that time. And I said, we're going to write a $100,000 check. And she said, okay, you're kind of making my stomach hurt a little bit because this was early in our journey. And I said, well, listen, and I put my arm around her and I said, you're going to probably have to get used to having stomach aches because this is how we're going to roll. We're going to live big and we're going to get big. And, uh, you know, she's always been with me in that. And now it does, now it's like, whatever, you know, whatever you think that we should do, let's do. She's, she's right there with me. But again, you know, people think like, if you ask the average person, what's a lot of money, like you're a lot is very minuscule when it comes to God. You know, it's like, it's like microscopic. So we've got to, we've got to think bigger. We have a big God and it's not about amounts. It's like, Hey, whatever measure rule I have, that's what I'm going to do. So again, that would be an offshoot of us being God first is that we are generous people. And I think that's the greatest, my personal opinion is it's the greatest superpower anybody could ever have is to be generous. Well, I would say too, that, you know, Keith started this out by talking about, you know, core values and, you know, our, we live by our core values, honor, 100%. positive attitude, excellence, generosity, leadership. That's our, we call it the big five in our family and our children. My son has that tattooed on his body. He's got our family crest tattooed on his body. Our kids have totally bought into that. And like you said, you know, our mission statement, we established that with our kids, uh, actually painted it on our table. Now I have it engraved on the table. We kind of um, uh, elevated a little bit from a painting to an engraving, but we kept it on our kitchen table. Just as a reminder, never allow the good to be robber of the best. And so I just, I think more is that we've lived our core values. We've spoken that uh, we continue to speak our mission statement. They've adopted all of that into their families. The same, you know, they loved it so much because they, that's what they lived in. So they adopted that same thing into their families and their spouses have adopted that also. And uh, so, so all of my children, they would see treasure boxes in our house. That's what she called them. Cause she would keep all the cards that I would give her. And so they could open up any one of those boxes, read any card from all the way back to when we were 15. And that got into their spirit, that spirit of honor. And so all of them now, they celebrate their anniversary on the first, the seventh, and I think the fifth. And they all have a, they all have a monthly anniversary that they honor each other, you know, and so they've adopted that. So that's a superpower. When it, when it goes from you to the next generation, that's a superpower. So the superpower would be that, that we've lived by core values. We've lived by our mission statement. And again, it's like your parents being around you, Chris, it's not perfect, but you fight for it. And you say, Hey, we're not perfect in this. We haven't done everything right, but at least we're, we're pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Progress over perfection. Right. Yeah. Amen. Well, thank you so, so much for your time. We are. It has been a blessing. It has thank been you a, for it. It has been a blessing. Thank you. And I usually ask the, the guest to pray us out. So Pastor Keith, would you pray us out? Sure. Sure. Father, I just thank you for the privilege that we have to exhibit heaven on earth through our marriages, to experience heaven on earth through our marriages. Because the first institution that you established, even before the church, was a man and a woman who became one in holy matrimony. Marriage is the template for business. It's the template for every relationship. And if we can understand that, God, then, Lord, you will so bless us indeed. You will so enlarge our territory. 
your hand will be so upon us that you will keep us from not only experiencing the pain and disruption of dysfunction and an unhealthy relationship, but God, you will use the two as one as you, Father, as you, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are one. So God, I thank you that according to Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, two are better than one because a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. And how we go from two to three is we make God our partner in our marriage. So I thank you for Chris and his wife. I thank you for this new podcast. I speak a blessing on it. I pray that every guest that they have will inspire dozens and hundreds and thousands and maybe millions of people to be more for the kingdom of God. Father, I speak a bless over a blessing over their marriage. I speak a blessing over every person, over every marriage that will ever listen to this podcast. And we thank you and we honor you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. God bless y'all. Yes, we enjoyed it. It was great being with you guys and meeting you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Faith, Family, Fulfillment, brought to you by Chris and Suzanne Vester. We hope you enjoyed listening to this week's guests and stories. If you liked what you heard, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow Chris and Suzanne on Instagram at H-V-A-U-T-O-C-O-O and Suzanne.C.Vester. That's at S-U-Z-A-N-N-E dot C dot V-E-S-T-E-R. 